I will learn, I will learn to walk in your way, step by step, step by step. You I say this morning that you are my God. Lord, on behalf of your church, we say this morning that you are our God. Money is not our God. Fame is not our God. Pleasure is not our God. All the demons and idols of this world are not our God. Ogun is not our God. Ifa is not our God. Nothing that is created is our God. You are our God and we will follow you always. Lord, we ask that your grace will pour on our hearts and help us in any ways that any of these idols have crept in and want to posture and eclipse your image in our hearts. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will pull them down. Grant us the sobriety of mind and self-awareness to think and to find and diagnose what the real problems of our hearts are and help us, Lord, to pull them down. Lord, help us to pull them down. Lord, continue to be our God all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you on this wonderful Lord's Day. Hallelujah. So, overcoming the world, part five. Hallelujah. So, um, we're talking about idols and things that have been trying to take the place of God in our hearts. And um, we've talked about what idols do. We've talked about money as an idol. We've talked about glory, personal glory as an idol. And I'm so happy with the recap. And I please, brothers and sisters, please continue um, in, this, in this strength. Um, this is what, um, that's how we should be. Praise God. Praise God. And you know, one of the signs that, and you'll see this later, one of the signs that you are really hearing God's word is how God's word shines a light on the corners of your heart so that even the places where you think you are doing well, the word of God will show you that you have a lot more to do. Praise God. So I just want to, you know, just reemphasize for us that, see, brothers and sisters, what we really need is good. We don't need glory. Do you understand? Glory is for God. Amen. Glory is for who? What you need is good. That's why he works all things according to, he works all things together for the good of those who love him, are called according to his purpose. What you need is good, not glory. What you need is God, not glory. Praise God. So don't live your life in pursuit of glory. Don't live your life in pursuit of validation. Live your life in pursuit of that which is good for you. That is, which is the purpose of God for your life, which is the will of God for your life. Are we together? I know we are broken and we have issues and there are these injuries and sores in our hearts and there are these holes in our, in our being that we just feel incomplete. 
and we're trying to feel it and we think that it is validation and glory and authority and all these things that will feel it but brothers and sisters you listen to what we said last week and i'm sure that as we as you continue to you know study god's word you will see it also for yourself you cannot satisfy because glory is not for you glory is for god hallelujah that is the reason why like and i just said passing last week and i just i just kept thinking about it this week why celebrities that are so rich so powerful so influential so famous We'll still be having meltdowns on social media, competing with one another, still responding to other people's tweets because somebody said, oh, you're not that great. Oh, this other person is better than you. I don't want to mention names, right? So, you know, say, no, so, say, ah, they've collected your endorsement. Oh, and then I want to not be having meltdowns. I'll say, you'll not be speaking incorrect English. And I'll say, bro, what do you want again in life? Do you understand that? If you are living your life for glory, you will never be satisfied. Some things I just want to emphasize. Remember that you can have more than one idol. Idols don't mind sharing. That's why there can be, there's an alliance in our context, especially there's an alliance between the idol of money and ego in our culture. In our culture, everybody wants to be Udoku. Everybody wants to be deeply respected. Do you understand what I'm saying? Everybody wants to be Udoku Makanaki. And you know, you want to be the big man. And you know, in some cultures are even more obvious than others, even though they have different ways of manifesting themselves. But that desire to want to be the Odogo, to be respected, to be the man. That desire to want to be the man. <laughs> the desire to want to be the financial firstborn. <laughs> Praise God. It's a, it's a joke about something that was said about some, you know, some, some pastors and everything. Say, there's this man of God, this one is his financial firstborn. What it means is that he has many spiritual sons, but the richest one that gives him the biggest gift is the financial firstborn. <laughs> See, we, we have issues, we have problems. So because of that, there's this, there's this weird alliance between the idol of ego and the idol of money, where you want to make money so that everybody can respect you and fear you. Do you understand that? And so that is the reason why in our culture, you see that we are very materialistic, we are very proud, we are very classist, we are very elitist, we tend to dehumanize people who don't have money as much as we do, we constantly have a sense of superiority to anybody that doesn't have as much money that we do as we have. That's why we tend to be unfeeling, we cannot be touched by the suffering of others, we, that's why you see a lot of tone deafness in the way we behave ourselves because we really think that those things make us great. We really think that our money makes us, so we take a lot of pride in how we have money more than others. So that's the reason why people can be very tone deaf. They, don't, they can't see the sufferings of people around them. There's this thing about life is that for you to be able to really um, understand the sufferings of people and what people are going through, you must be with them in their suffering. But when you feel, you, 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 you must identify with them. If you can't identify with people and you have a sense of superiority from people, you cannot be touched with their feelings of infirmity. That's what the Bible tells us that Jesus actually came in the flesh to become a brother and sister like us, so I can deliver us. Hebrews chapter 1 and chapter 20, chapter 6, and now crowns it up by saying that, that we have a high priest, well, we don't have a high priest that cannot be touched by our feelings of infirmity, but one who has been through what we have been through. That's the reason why there's so much tone deafness among the rich people in Nigeria. That's why, because of that sense of superiority. You can't understand what people are going through if you think you are better than them. That's why we're going to do anything in service to these idols of ego and money. They have this weird alliance in our culture. But that's why in our culture, you will see teenagers behaving each other for money. That's why you see teenagers willing people and assaulting them and removing their kidneys. That's why you find teenagers that are fraudsters and 419 and doing yahoo yahoo. And their parents will encourage them. And their parents will not ask where they got money from. Because the parents will get glory from the fact that my child is richer than your child. Church, are you seeing what I'm saying to you? So, because idols don't mind sharing. So, you find this alliance. You find this weird alliance between them. Praise God. And so this alliance between the idol of ego and money makes us a deeply satisfied people. 
with ob obscene ambition. So you hear people all over the world say Nigerian Americans are the highest earning groups, just a little bit lower than the Japanese Americans. You know, say uh, in the UK, Nigerian British are the second most successful immigrants groups and all those things. And we see it like something to be proud of. It's not. Not in all cases. What I mean is this. What you're actually seeing manifested is an obscene ambition because of the idolatry of money and ego. You go to another country, and the reason why you even went to the country in the first place is because you want to stand out from all your family members. All your family members, nobody has ever traveled abroad but among them. So you travel there and you do any kind of job. As long as your mother is back home in Nigeria telling people, my child is in America. My child is in the UK. And then you will now hustle, do any kind of thing. And that's why many of them go there and become criminals. You do any kind of job to make money. Of course, if you have a whole group of people with that kind of culture and they move to another country, of course they become successful materially. Praise God. How would they not be successful? Of course they'll be successful. So many times what people call Nigerian immigrants um, successfulness or success and all that is really just the idol of money and ego manifesting. Church, I was together. Please focus. So money and ego, they tag team on our souls such that even when we have made a lot of money, we will keep finding vanity projects that need capital. And as such, no amount of money is enough for us. And so that's the reason why you see this weird alliance between the idols of ego and money. One of the things that it leads to is that both of them will be mutually reinforcing each other in a very weird way that you'll find out that money will never be enough. That's why you look at some of our politicians and some other people that are very rich in Nigeria and be wondering why they keep doing things. They keep looking for money and the money is never enough because when you have an idol of ego, it requires you to have an idol of money to continue sponsoring that ego. So I hear what I'm saying to you. So that's why politicians can never have enough money because maintaining their power over others requires them continually having resources. Requires them to continually having resources to bribe, to give gifts, to purchase things and to buy things. So no amount of money is enough because if you want to maintain a certain ego and a certain standard of people looking at you in a particular way, the money will never be enough because the money to bribe will never be enough. Money to buy gifts for people will never be enough. Even when you have had millions of dollars, it won't be enough because others have built a bigger church building. And so that's why you find out that no matter how, in a culture where ego is an idol, in a culture where ego is an idol and it has crept into the, into the church, Certain quarters of the church will notice that they can never have enough money, no matter how much they have. Because after you have built the biggest church cathedral, somebody else will build a similar size of church cathedral. And after you have, when all of you have built the same size of cathedral, the next thing will be, will be to build a cathedral with a different style that nobody has ever built before. After you have now built one with different style and another person has built another one with a very style, with a big style that you have never built before, then the next thing is to buy a jet. When everybody starts buying the same kind of jet, you will now buy a Gulf Stream. And when everybody buys a Gulf Stream, you will have three, four packed. And when everybody has bought four, or everybody has bought three, or it's no more a big deal, and so people are chattering Gulf Stream with you, you build an airstrip. Money will never be enough. It will never be enough. Because the money is constantly funding your ego. Church, are we together? As I mean, when people talk about becoming rich and raising money so that we can sponsor the gospel, if you look around you, many times what people are sponsoring is not the gospel. It's a certain taste of doing ministry. That's what you are sponsoring. You are sponsoring a certain taste of dream ministry. You are not sponsoring the gospel. Church, I together. This is the thing. Your ego will make, ensure that money is never enough. Your ego ensures that you worship money because to share glory is to lose glory. That's one problem with us. To share glory is to lose glory. 
it is in, for we human beings with our brokenness, it is important for us that we are the ones alone being told that we are great. The moment someone shares that glory with, glory with us, that we are great, that somebody else is great like us, that glory, that validation, it loses its taste. Because to share glory is to lose glory. A validation and, affirm, and an affirmation that you share loses its taste. Praise God. So travel together. You don't need glory. You need good. What you need is to have God. What you need is to have the good. You don't need glory. Glory is for God. What you need is the good. What you need is to have God and to do his will for your life. That is what you need. I pray for everybody from the bottom of my heart. That if there's anybody who has any deep affliction and deep inordinate desire for praise and glory and validation and fame and influence and power, that the Lord will heal your heart in the name of Jesus. I pray for you that the blood of Jesus will wash your heart clean and that your trust and security will be in God and God alone. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Let's quickly look at the next idol that we're going to talk about. And today is the idol of hedonism or the idol of enjoyment. So we've talked about the idol of money in our context. We've talked about the idol of ego. So today we're going to talk about the idol of hedonism or the idol of enjoyment. The next week we'll end with the idol, the literal idols, the actual evil spirits that people worship. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 2. Chapter 2, from verse 1. And you were dead in, in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Hallelujah. Mankind are children of wrath. But he now talks about something. He says, we once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind. Praise God. Because we are broken, when Adam fell, all of us fell with him into a corrupted nature and everybody born of Adam has this corrupted nature. And because of that corrupted nature, that corrupted nature also has certain desires. This nature that we have has certain desires. And so the desire to, because we have this desire, we want to feel that desire. Remember what I, you know, we talk about in this church in the book of Proverbs chapter 13. Hope deferred makes the heart what? But the longing fulfilled is a spring of what? Life. Every suffering in this world, every pain in this world comes from the fact that you desire something and you didn't get it. Every negative emotion comes from the fact that you wanted something and you couldn't get it. Anger comes from the fact that you wanted something and something robbed you of it. Um, hatred comes from the fact that there's a particular thing or person that is constantly standing in the way of something that you want. Depression comes from the fact that you wanted something and you couldn't get it. Every negative emotion in this world comes from the fact that you can't get something. At the same time, every positive emotion, bliss, joy, happiness, comes from the fact that you wanted something and you what? Got it. The problem is that if you have a broken nature, and you have bad desires, what will make you happy? Aha, uh -huh. thank you very much, right? Because if you have a broken nature and you have bad desires, what will make you happy is fulfilling your bad desires. Do you understand what happened now? That's what Paul is referring to here when he says that all of us with the rest of mankind were by nature children of wrath, we're following the passions of our flesh. So there are certain things that, you know, there are certain passions inside of us in our flesh, that flesh that we inherited from Adam, that natural nature, we are following the passions of it. And we're carrying out, so we're fulfilling the desires of the body and of the mind. Because when we think about the flesh, people think the flesh is just our body. No, the flesh is the nature, the falling inner man and the outer man that is broken. Praise God. Shall we together? And so, if you look at Luke chapter 4, you know, we've been using Jesus' temptation as a kind of narrative to see how these three idols work together, how they align with the temptation of Jesus. So the first one was about bread, material security. The second one was about glory, 
um, and the nations of the world. Now, this third one, look at Luke chapter 4 from verse 9. We read it earlier. It says, And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to test. Now, this temptation, particularly, is the one that is most difficult to really understand what the point was. Of all the other temptations, there are more a little bit clearer to see what what is the real temptation here. But this one is a little bit more difficult because Satan quoted the scripture. And the scripture is not a lie. It's in Psalms. I will give my angels charge over you and they will bear you up. So he's asking him to do something. And so when we just look at it on the surface, we'll try to understand it based on what Satan said. But the key to understanding the real temptation, the real temptation, the real idol, because for Satan to bring out a temptation, you know, I mean, Jesus, God is in the flesh. Satan wants to tempt Jesus. What he will come with is that he will come with the tools that he knows work very well for human beings. Do you understand that? He will come with his best temptations that he knows works very well for human beings. So to really understand what the real temptation was, you need to look at Jesus' response. And what the Lord said is that it, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And so on the surface, you just think that uh, it's, a, it's a bad thing. Even though deep down inside us, we cannot really see the connection with, with why it's really a bad thing to ask God to do something. I want to, I want to jump. And Jesus said, you take care of me, why can't I jump? He said, thou shalt not test the Lord your God. So we try to understand it as, on the surface, just understand it as, um, you know, don't test God. So, and all those kinds of things. But the, let's look at how, what Jesus, where Jesus quoted from, for you to really understand what the temptation actually was and why Jesus responded the way he did. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. So this is what Jesus was quoting from. This is the scripture that he was quoting to respond to Satan's temptation. Verse 16 says, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, as you tested him at Massa. So we're going to look at what happened at Massa. But look at the point that Moses makes first. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. So this this is what Jesus is quoting from. He says, Moses is telling the people that you will not test God. Rather, you will keep the commandments that he commands you. Verse 18, and he says, And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you, and that you may go in and take possession of the good land which the Lord swore to your father. So, you will do what God has commanded you. You will do what is good and right in the sight of God, not what is good and right in your own sight. Do you understand that? To put it well, let's look at what actually happened in Massa that Moses was referring to, so you can have a good picture. In Exodus chapter 17, Exodus chapter 17, from verse 1 to 7. And all the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? Now, people were thirsty. And they were asking for water. And Moses is telling them that they are testing God. How is this testing God? But the people, verse, verse 3, But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people, take him with you some of the elders of Israel, and take your hand the stuff which is, yeah, with, which, with which you struck the nail, and go. Praise God. Now, this is it. Putting everything together. If God is our God, and there is no other God, it means that when we are living our lives, we are living our lives based on what God has commanded, and what is right and good in God's eyes, not what is good in our sights. Do you hear what I just said now? We are not doing things that are good to us. We are not doing things that we want to do. As believers, we do things that are good in God's sight. So let me tell you the real issue here. When you have a desire, and you, you have a desire, you have something that you are passionate about, you have a passion, you can hold on to that passion so much 
that it will not matter what God wants you to do. We're not meant to live our lives based on what we want to do. We're meant to live our lives based on what God wants us to do. So testing the Lord is about pursuing your own desires instead of obeying and leaning on God. So God's people cannot do things because they feel like doing them. They do things because God will have them do it. So Jesus would not say, I'm the son of God and I will just jump from the top of somewhere and God must catch me. No, whatever he's going to do, he would do it because he sees what his father is doing. He will not do something because he feels like doing it. He does it because that's what his father wants him to do. When we have attachments to certain things that we want in our life, certain things that we desire, that we enjoy doing, that we enjoy, certain things that give us pleasure, when we are so attached to them, we let those things determine what we live for. We don't live for what God wants us to do. We live for achieving that happiness. So that is the definition of hedonism. Hedonism is the pursuit of your own happiness. The idol of enjoyment is pursuing enjoyment. Whatever makes you feel good, you are pursuing it. Praise God. So there is nothing wrong in having needs and asking God to meet them. But there is everything wrong in putting our desires above God's will. And so how did that testing the Lord manifest for the Israelites at Massa was that they desired that water so much. They were thirsty and they desired that, that water to quench their thirst so much that they grumbled against God. Murmuring is a sign that you have idolized something. Murmuring comes from the despair. When you look at something that you are not getting, you look at something that you want very badly and you are not getting that thing. Murmuring comes from the place of you are not getting that thing. As if there is no other person in that equation called God who is in control. Murmuring is that despair that comes from when you are addicted to a particular outcome and you cannot imagine yourself having any other particular outcome. You are going to look at God as a means to achieve that outcome, not as God who is the end in himself. But I hear what I'm saying to you. God is not the essence of your life. That thing is the essence of your life. And so that is why you will murmur and abuse God. Because like, like we read in the Dada case some months ago, a lot of people might not have been here that time. The Dada case is written there. Anybody that blasts, anybody that murmurs will eventually do what? Blaspheme. Because what happens at that point is that God becomes a tool to achieve what you want. So when that tool is not working well, what do you do with the tool? You abuse it. Drag it. When something is not going right in your life, if, if God is the end of your desires, what are you meant to do? Is it not to look at God and say, God, what is happening? Isn't it? Are you not meant to implore the Lord and say, Lord, this is what I'm going through, such that you say some things now. But you now find yourself looking at something and God has not given you what you want. The response is murmuring. So that's why murmuring is a sign of idolatry. So testing God is, this is what I want. This is how I want to live my life. And God is meant to fund what I want, not what he wants. You'll see something now. That's why you find out that a lot of things we're calling prayer in this whole faith movement is hedonic prayer. I've created an entity that will sponsor what you want, not what he wants. That's why a lot of people will look at, if you pray the kind of prayer that Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, if you pray the kind of prayer that Paul prayed in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 today, people will tell you you don't have faith. If you pray a prayer where you say, Lord, I want this, but let your will be done. You say, no, you don't have faith. You're supposed to tell God what you want till the end and don't shake. <laughs> so what happened there is that you have idolized that thing. God's will is not a factor in your conversation. So the, the idol of hedonism is doing that which is pleasing to us it is living for what we enjoy. It is following what makes our body and mind happy apart from God. So hedonism is looking for things, finding things that make you happy outside of God. And we have that idol in our culture. It is the idol of enjoyment, the, the idol of wanting to have a good time, the idol of wanting to get things that make you feel good and enjoy yourself. Hedonism is the pursuit of personal happiness and pleasure rather than God's pleasure. 
It is putting our desires above God's will. And that is the reason why, as, even as a third temptation, it was it's particularly hard. It's particularly hard to diagnose. It's very hard to diagnose. Because many times, for the idol of enjoyment, for example, in particular, is that the idol of enjoyment will always find a place starting inside of God's word. That's why Satan could quote a Bible, the scripture, and say, he will give his angels charge over you. For example, the Bible tells in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that he's the one that gives us enjoy, isn't it? He gives us all things richly to enjoy. So, we want everybody that is rich in this world not to trust on certain riches, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, but to trust in the living God who gives us all things richly to enjoy. So, there's a place for enjoying things. God actually gives us common grace, He gives us common blessings. Acts chapter 13, it says, it is this same God that has sent rain from heaven to fall upon your lands and give you crops so that your bellies may be full and you might know that there is a God that is good out there. God actually gives us things to enjoy, isn't it? And so that's why this particular idol is very difficult to diagnose because God gives you things to enjoy and then what will happen if you're not careful is that you begin to enjoy those things more than you enjoy God. You begin to desire those things at the expense of the will of God for your life. Praise God. So hedonism, the idol of enjoyment, is an inordinate attachment to our desires. And for the Israelites, it's manifested as murmuring. When we have deep negative emotions because we are not getting what we want, that thing has become an idol. But I hear what I'm saying now. When you have deep negative emotions because you're not getting a particular thing, it means that God is not the source of your happiness. And what is the definition of idolatry we've been talking about for the last four Sundays? Anything that gives you what? Happiness, meaning, and a what? Identity more than God. So if there's anything that you have God, yet you have God though, you're a child of God, you have God, yet you don't have that thing. And because you don't have that thing, you are depressed. It means that the source of your happiness is not who? Because you have God, why are you not happy? Did you hear what I just said now? Huh? Did you hear what I just said now? Your deep negative emotions. I didn't get this thing. And I'm thrown into a deep depression and suffering and murmuring. Because of this thing. That thing is the source of your happiness. And anybody that, that, that there's something that's the source of your happiness apart from God, they are going to um, deny God. Their love for God cannot be strong, of course, obviously. So that's why for the Israelites, it manifested as murmuring when they could not get water. The God that brought us out of the land of Egypt, doesn't, doesn't he at least deserve, um, what the, what's that word that you guys call it? I mean, second, um, I mean, benefit of second doubt. I mean, it's the benefit of the doubt, Jerry. It's a second doubt. <laughs> Someone that parted the Red Sea for you. Someone that said, I'm delivering you so that you can save me has saved you, finish, and brought you out. You now don't have water. You now say you want to stone the man of God. <laughs> That's why once the man of God went and they did not see him, what did they do? Immediately. Immediately. Sharp, sharp. Because God was not an end to them. For them at that point, God was still a tool to be, that saves you from slavery. God was still a tool that saves them from what? Slavery. Not the one for whom they were living. Let's travel together. For Jesus, this idol would have manifested as taking a step that is not in sync with the Father. Because the Lord tells us over and over that I did not do anything except what my Father in heaven does. Isn't it? Now jump from all states because Satan says so. Not because my Father does it. That's why I told Satan, thou shalt not test the Lord your God. And so that is why. Hedonic prayers are praying for things as if we are the only ones that have agency and not God. Here I just said now. There are something called hedonic prayers. That means prayers that are prayed for your own will. That's what James talks about. He said that some of you are never getting what you are praying for because you are praying for things to be consumed upon your own lust. And if you are smart enough, if you are charismatic enough, you can package hedonic prayers as prayers of faith. True faith is in God. Faith is not in faith. 
True faith is in God. And so if you, are, if you have a God that loves you, that knows more than you, that is wiser than you, how is it possible that everything that you ever ask for yourself, he will always give you? It's, you must assume that you know all things. You must assume that you are all wise. It must assume that you always know what is good. You that you don't even know if you wake up tomorrow morning. Watch out together. When James talks about being of single mind, he's not talking about being of single mind in the terms of you are telling God what to do for you and God must sponsor your desire. No. Singleness of mind is faith in God that God is faithful and he will never put me to shame. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? So that even if I'm asking for wisdom, all the things that I need for that wisdom, God will give me. That scripture was never meant to say that you can insist on having your own way and God must do it. That is the temptation that Satan told Jesus. Jump if you want to. Put your faith on the line. Have a consistent confession. But no, it's just that you can't test God. You can't tell God what to do. Who is Lord? Jesus, being truly man and truly God, showed us what prayer looks like in the Garden of Gethsemane. That he was praying and saying, Lord, if this cup can pass over me. Father, this cup can pass over me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be what? No. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul had a dim, he, he turned from, he, 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 his messenger from Satan. And the Bible says that Paul prayed three times and God answered. After God answered, what did he do? A lot of people will have said, his faith was not strong enough. He will tell him about the faith of Hezekiah. The faith that turns to the war and makes God change his mind. Your changeable changer becomes a mind changer. <laughs> ah, that's why I know people that just got saved now. <laughs> that they've been in the world. Hallelujah. Praise God. Church, are we together? Mm. Mind you, the story of Hezekiah is the story of God's sovereignty in prayer. God ordains the means and the ends of all things. So God ordained the means of prayer as a way for changing outcomes, not a way of changing his mind. That's why I said, if my people who call upon my name will humble themselves and pray, I will turn. So Hezekiah didn't change God's mind. God ordained that if you pray, I can turn a situation around. You can't change God's mind. If it was never an option, you would never become an option. Do you hear what I just said now? If it was never an option in God, it will never become an option because you prayed. Thank you very much. <laughs> Praise God. So we start praying hedonic prayers. Hedonism manif manifests in the mindset that God cannot say no to whatever we want. Hedonic prayers are prayers that have faith in faith, not in God's wise will and love. We can just confess jumping off a cliff and God has to send his angels to catch us. Many, pe many people today are praying the prayer of hedonists who are testing God. Hallelujah. But let's get into, detail, into brass tacks. Let's talk about examples of things that we actually idolize, right? So, the, so yeah, we can get attached to certain things that make us happy. We can get attached to certain things that we enjoy. We can get attached to them so tightly that we attach to them more than we attach to God. Praise God. And so, for us, what are examples of such things that we get so attached to? What are things that we begin to have passions for? We begin to have passions for sexual pleasure, which leads to all kinds of immorality, fornication, adultery, pornography, homosexuality, pedophilia, and all the other disorders of, of, that humanity has been manifesting. It starts with an attachment to the enjoyment of sex. God is the one that gave us sex. But because we don't idolize sex and we, we worship the God that gave us sex, we will carry out sex according to how the God that gave us sex we should use it. Do you understand that? The moment you now idolize, you want sex so much that you are willing to do it outside of the way that the God that created sex said we should do it, what you are manifesting and saying is that you want the sex of the God. Did you hear what I just said to you now? Remember what we've been saying. This is how to know what to love apart from God because only God should have your love. Does that mean you should not love or enjoy any other thing? No. This is the truth. There is only one person that we're meant to love. We're meant to love the Lord our God with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our what? 
heart. But because we love the Lord, everything that the, love, the Lord loves, we also love. So that's why we can love every man as ourselves. That Jesus, that's why Jesus said the second temptation, the second commandment is just like it. Because we love God, we love people. Apostle John said a lot of this in the book of 1 John. Because we love God, we must love people. Because we love God, we must love our lives, our wives, the way Christ loves the church. Because we love God, we must love our husbands. Because we love God, we must take care of our children in the covenant. Because we love God, we must do our work as a contribution to common grace and as a way that God is going to subdue and to provide for people around us. Because we love God, we are going to do all the things that God's word tells us to do. We're not doing any of those things instead of God. And so because we love God, our sexual ethic will be according to what God says about sex. The moment we are willing to pursue sex outside of what God, or the enjoyment of sex, outside of what God has said we should do, what we are demonstrating and what we are saying is that we like sex more than God. And this is the thing about idols. Romans chapter 1 is very clear. Once you suppress the knowledge of God, and you begin to pursue things for how to enjoy, your heart will get darker and darker and darker. So many people think, and they're right. Many people, you hear people say things like, ah, a culture that legalizes homosexuality in the society and allows it in the society, we begin to see other depravity. So you begin to see transgenderism and transvestitism. You begin to see lobby for pedophilia and all that. And they are right, but they only have true. Do you know where that problem started from? That problem started from the times you were watching series that were showing a man and a woman living together without being married. It's not when they legalized homosexuality, it's when they legalized fornication. Yeah. That problem started from cohabiting. The society begins to disintegrate when people start having sex out of marriage as a norm. It's not when you start allowing gay people to marry each other. By the time you start allowing people to get marry each other as gay people, your society is gone already. Just leave it. Let anything that comes after, just allow. Because the real problem, the real problem is the ethic apart from God's will. Church, all together. It starts from a society that allows pornography websites. You want to allow pornography websites, but you, 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 don't, you, you have an issue with your children are saying they want to be transgender and you are fighting that they should not cut off their breasts. <laughs> you planted a big tree, a roko tree. You now saw one leaf. You now say, no. <laughs> this tree, this leaf, don't grow. Don't grow. The leaf now grew up. You are trying to cut the leaf. The roko tree is very thick in the ground. You have a society that there's no legislation against pornography. A 13-year-old child can just go on the website, on the internet, and just see men, and men and just see anything. You are, you are angry that they are taking children to, to castrate them. Once you have come out of the biblical sexual ethic, what God that created says, once you have come out of it, anything that follows, take it like that. So that's why, in fact, in a way, I miss the old pagan society because Christianity wants too much. Overwinning is worrying us. Christianity won. You won the West. You conquered the societies. Your popes ruled the West and you controlled society. And the whole world is basically now a colony of Christian ideals. Do you know that? Yes. The whole world is basically a colony of Christian ideals. So we don't even know what is what. Again. I miss the days when pagans were just pagans, clear. You just be a Greek pagan and in our society, you can have small, small boys that will be living with you for your enjoyment. And nobody argues. That's how the world has always been. Nobody argues with the Greeks or the Romans or the Persians or the Ottomans or the Arabs. Nobody argues with them when they have ten wives, two small boys that are sex slaves. <laughs> Church, are we together? It's the idolatry of enjoyment, the idolatry of pleasure, the, the, the desire to, the pursuit of happiness. That this is what makes me happy, and I'm allowed to pursue it. No, you're not allowed to pursue what makes you happy. You're allowed to pursue God. If you pursue what makes you happy with your broken nature, Adam's descendants, you will destroy yourselves. Adam's children, if you pursue what makes you happy, you will land in hell. That's where the passion for drugs and substances comes from. That's where the passion for nice experiences, traveling abroad, Seeing nice places. That's where the passion for food and drink 
gluttony and alcoholism is the pursuit of happiness. Whatever makes me feel good. The pursuit for nice things, fine houses, fine cars, nice phones. Every upgrade of phone, I must have it. That's where it comes from. People with all these idols will tell you that they just want to be happy. And so this is why people can be so happy doing all kinds of sexual perversions. As a lot of people will tell you that I was very depressed when I just had same-sex attractions and I was not consummating it. But the moment I found a guy and we got married and started living together, I became very happy and I was no more depressed. Yeah. Hope the Fed makes the heart sick. But a desire fulfilled is a what? Yeah. That is the reason why, if you watch Dharma, someone that is a serial killer, what makes him happy is seeing women die in a particular way mutilated. And so honestly and truly, when he kills women grotesquely, he feels what? So let's be pursuing happiness. Let us be pursuing happiness. Let us all pursue happiness. Let Nigerian politicians do what makes them happy. Let's see. And so if you are paying attention, you'll have noticed that the idol of enjoyment also has alliances with the idol of money and the idol of ego to enslave us. The idol of mammon often helps establish the idol of enjoyment and the idol of ego can also help further the cause of the idol of mammon. Hallelujah. Let's talk about the cost of hedonism, the cost of this idol of enjoyment. I want to feel good. I want to have a nice time. I just want to have a nice time. This thing, it manifests in so many different ways. And I pray that more than I can ever say, it, the Lord will minister to your heart as it has been doing in Jesus' name. Many of you have been pursuing your relationship lives based on this hedonism, this pursuit of enjoyment. That's what, you, that's what has, that has been the basis of all your relationship choices. Enjoyment. The person that makes you feel good. That has been the basis of your, even the way you, the way you choose a local church. You choose a local church based on how the place makes you feel good and how you enjoy yourself, not based on what is the will of God for you. It affects how we pursue our jobs, the kind of jobs that we pick. It's constantly about how we, and this thing is such a terrible thing because if you have an idol of enjoyment, even when you get married, they're going to stress your partner. Even when you are doing your job and you have a good work that God has given to you, that work, you're going to destroy it. So shall we together? The idol of enjoyment makes us worse through hedonic adaptation. In this church, we've talked about it a lot, right? Many of you now, if you go and do masters in psychology and everything, you now talk, you see hedonic adaptation. Like, ah, in our church, we always talk about this thing. The idol, of, the idol of enjoyment. This is how it makes us enemies of God through this thing called hedonic adaptation. And you guys know what it is. For those that don't know what it is, hedonic adaptation is the, is the idea that. Um, for everything that you enjoy, over time, that enjoyment loses its taste. No matter how big the enjoyment is now, no matter how much you enjoy something now, over time, that thing will lose its taste. Over time, that thing will lose its taste. And so what will happen is that you have to keep getting more to achieve the same level of pleasure and enjoyment that you had in previous times. And the more you pursue it, the more you pursue it, the bigger enjoyment you try to pursue, or the more things that you invest to get that level of enjoyment, the less enjoyment you actually have from it. That is the reason why when a new iPhone comes out, you are so eager to buy it. But after one month, how does the phone look in your hand? You want to buy this car so badly, no matter how much you, you say, I want to buy the car, you buy the car, and after three months, six months, and other people now have the car, you, you notice that the car has become common. You stop feeling the car. You don't need an adaptation sets in for every material pleasure in this world. Same thing that happens to drug addicts. The first time you take it, you get a high, but after that, it begins to depreciate, and you keep going higher and higher and higher with the amount of drugs that you take until the point where you take a, a, a dosage of the drug that is more than your body can take and the person dies. Same thing with sex. You keep looking for new and new and new things. When sex is your idol, you keep looking for new and new and new interesting things to try something new. Before you know it, <laughs> you've started trying all kinds of things. And so this is the thing. Because of this simple fact, 
because of the fact that we are broken and only God can truly satisfy, none of those things that satisfy, what our being is telling us is that those things cannot satisfy as we are pursuing those things. Now, this is the problem, is that in pursuing the things that we can use to get that enjoyment that is reducing every time, there are costs. You are spending something to get that enjoyment and that enjoyment is reducing. You are spending money, you are spending time, you are spending mental awareness, you are spending focus, you are spending resources in order to achieve that enjoyment that is constantly depreciating. And so, because the pursuit of these experiences have costs, the size of the experience we need grows and the cost also what grows. So examples of the cost that we usually spend include things like our attention and love for God. Because we can't have time to fellowship with God and think about him as we obsess about these passions. This is the reason why indulging in them often requires banishing our awareness of God from our minds. Church, all together. Many times you can't enjoy it. Two things cannot be the source of your happiness at the same time. That is the reason why whenever a person is committing sexual sin, one of the things that you notice is that in that moment, they can't be thinking of God. Did you hear what I just said now? In that moment, God cannot be in your mind. In that moment, you are a little atheist. Because in that moment, God is not real. God cannot exist. It's after the sin is complete that you now start realizing that there is a God. Have you guys noticed what I'm saying? Every time someone is stealing money, in that moment, God does not exist. At least not the holy God of the Bible. Every time people want to log into that website, in that moment, do you understand what I'm saying to you? That's why there are some things that usually you should make me upset. Like someone was saying one time that if you're addicted to pornography, you know what? Even as you're going to the website, you're speaking in tongues. <laughs> That's how I know a lot of people are speaking in tongues, that there's no God in it. Because in that moment, God cannot be there. So the cost of having something that we enjoy more than God is God. We cannot be enraptured with God while servicing these idols. If you enjoy these things too much, you won't enjoy God. That's why you notice, have you noticed that there are some levels of enjoyment that you get to, that you are not just feeling God? Do you know what I'm saying? Have you not noticed that if you read the Psalms, it's when you are suffering that you feel God's presence? There is a way that you have unmitigated pleasure that God doesn't come to your mind. That's why when we're talking about he has given us all things richly to enjoy, you have to know what we're talking about. We're talking about within the ambit of God's will. You know, there's some, there some spaces of mind that you get to. That's why over and over, that's why the Israelites didn't stand a chance. That's why Jesus had to come. They didn't stand a chance. Because every time you enter Canaan and everything becomes plenty, what happens? Idols. Then they will come, they will beat you, you turn to God again. And then when you turn to God, God, because God is merciful, he will answer you. If I is the one that will send you, the people that will deliver you. And it's even the one that will send you, the people that will make you turn to him. Then the people will now beat you, beat you, beat you, beat you. You will now turn to God again, and then God will now be with you. Once enjoyment starts, the cycle begins. Watch out together. Another cost of hedonism to us is that it's, imp- it's another cost Another cost is our ability to love people truly. So we're going to sacrifice true love for human beings in pursuit of our own happiness. People become objects and tools to achieve our enjoyment and not persons to be loved for themselves. But I hear what I'm saying to you. Listen to me. Listen to me, Christians. Listen to me. If you have an idol of a particular thing that you enjoy, you will not be able to love people because willing the good of people requires seeing their good end as the end to achieve in itself. Loving people excludes you looking at them as tools and objects. If you have things that you are very attached to that you want to enjoy, you become a user. Everybody around you becomes an object. That is the reason why marriage will not solve sexual addiction. Because if you get married to someone as a sex addict, sex is your idol. You are going to use your partner as an object. Anyone I'm saying to you? 
When you are so much attached to a particular thing, everything around you and every person around you becomes an object and a tool to achieve that thing that you want to enjoy. God himself will become an object and a tool. Even your prayer is to use God to get to that particular thing. Everybody around you, you're only looking at them in the light of how they can help you get to that thing. So the people that can help you get to it, you will value them more. The ones that cannot help, help you get to it, what will happen to them? You forget about them. Every time that you are giving people things, you are not giving people things, or whenever, whenever you are doing nice things to people, you are not doing those nice things to people because you love them, but because you are grooming them. Hi. Family Affairs Conference is coming, amen? I want to release some mysteries. <laughs> you can groom people, not because you love them. Sisters, are you what I'm saying? A guy can see you as an object. For his enjoyment and his ego. And we buy you nice things. Not because he loves you. He's grooming you to get what he wants. How you know that he loves you is that when you're talking about something that is good for you. Something that will enable you to fulfill your God's, God's life. God's plan for your life. That will cost him what he enjoys. That's when you will know whether he truly really loves you. Do you hear what I just said now? He bought you iPhone 16. He said he loves you. On my birthday, he was very nice to me. He's very spontaneous. You say he loves you. Somebody that is cooking you. When you are preparing your Christmas goat for Christmas, and you are waking up and cutting your sleep short to feed it, imagine the goat saying, oh my God. These people love me. They love me so much. Church, are we together? <laughs> Praise God. These idols will cost us our God-given gifts. We will spend all our money and all our time on these addictions. That's another thing that happens when we become addicted to these idols. We spend all our money, all our good-given gifts, all our God-given gifts on all these things just to achieve it. You become addicted to pornography, you start spending money on porn sites, sites that they are smuggling people and trafficking people, sites where they are Satan, where they are destroying people's life. You're going to be spending your money on it. That's what happens to people that become gamblers. That it, spending all your money on bed Niger, spending your money on prostitution, you start spending your God given gift that God has given you to use for, you, for His purpose for your life. You start spending it on this enjoyment. So that's why you see an adulterer, because he loves sex so much, goes and destroys his family. That's why you see a gambler will destroy his life savings. That's why you see a drug addict will destroy their lives. That's why you see someone will empty their savings because of a soft life. Everybody's traveling abroad, meantime must travel abroad. You now empty your savings and destroy your children's future because you want to enjoy yourself. So travel together. The result is that these our idols make us very wicked people. Because of the cost that we keep paying you know, in service of hedonism and in service of enjoyment, we become very, very wicked people. Look at what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, from verse 9. He says, Or do you not know that the righteous will not that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor what? Idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom. When someone says that they have same-sex attraction, that if I'm, if I'm a homosexual, I can never be a homosexual in Jesus' name, a child of God. Say, I have same-sex attraction, I have a lust for people of the same sex. You now say, um, how can it be wrong? It makes me happy when I do it. Bro, you'll be happy and go to hell. You cannot like that thing more than you like God. You cannot love God that thing more than you love God. And if you love God, you are going to, you are going to not practice it. If you practice it, you will go to hell. And you notice that it puts adulterers in the same line. So in case you are, you have side chick, and you are seeing homosexual, you're like, ugh, oh God. <laughs> Both of you with Satan on the last day. Ejoma <laughs> Juno. Church, I was together. Galatians chapter five. There's nothing you're meant to enjoy more than you enjoy God. 
Galatians 5, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Where are they from? The flesh. We have a broken nature that has desires. And if you desire, if you fulfill those desires, if you fulfill those passions, these are the things that you will do. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger. You see that? Rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 5. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is... Hey, brothers and sisters, listen to me. You see the way Paul is saying it over and over. Sexual immorality will take you to hell. I hear what I'm saying to you. Don't sleep with people that are not your husband or your wife. You will go to hell. Because the mere fact that you continue in it is proof that you don't have the seed of the word inside of you. The fact that it is your lifestyle. Repent now. Repent. If you don't repent, it is a sign that you love that thing more than you love God. And heaven is for only those that are God's people. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? You guys must have gone to schools and you must have heard Antinomians say things like, um, even if Jesus comes now, while I'm committing fornication, I will still go to heaven. Listen to me, if Jesus comes and catches you fornication, you're not going to heaven, no. Because you know what the Bible says? When I refer to 2 Thessalonians 3, that we are not like them, that the, the day of Jesus will catch them like a thief in the night. Amen? We are not like them. We will be ready, we will be sober, we will be prepared. If your mind is, my Lord is coming, let me see if I can fornicate while he comes. Your mind is not that, Lord, when you come, come, you are going to catch me in your presence. You are not a child of God. That is a loveless scenario. I've never seen any couple that really love themselves, that are planning, that honey, what if you enter the house and you catch me in a lottery? <laughs> I've never seen it before. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying to you? That question itself is proof. He says, everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and Chengbo. Don't fornicate. That is the behavior of people that are going to hell. Revelation chapter 21. Verse 7, the one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. But for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and what? So for which is the second death. What is the way out? Well, there's something I must admit here and which I've been talking about over and over is that we are broken. And we're not going to achieve sinless... No, let me not say that. Let me not say it like that before I make it feel like as if I'm... Let me not miscommunicate. We are awaiting our glorification. That day when the Lord comes and he's going to take away all the futility and brokenness of this world. So that means that we have an inherent weakness inside of us that we inherited from Adam. That we are going to deal with until the day that we see our Lord. So, having known that, having known that, like Jidio always says, our heart is an idol factory. Having known that our heart constantly wants to put up desires and elevate those desires above God. Having known that our heart is a natural factory and minting machine for idols. What is the way out? And brothers and sisters, it's something I've been saying over and over. I'm going to read another scripture today and I pray that God will use this one to reinforce what I've been saying to you. That the only way out of a wrong enjoyment is by bringing a stronger enjoyment. Only a stronger enjoyment can expel a weaker enjoyment. Psalm 63. This psalm is so good for making this point. I've been using different scriptures. Let's try using this one today. And I pray that if, if the previous ones ha, has missed you, that today's one will not miss you. Look at David's psalm. He says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there's no water. 
He says, I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. Have you gotten to the point where the love of God to you is better than life? That there's nothing they want to give you in this life, sex or money or travel abroad or anything, that nothing is better to you than your love for God. He says, so, verse 4, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my, to, in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. Can your soul be satisfied with Jesus as if your soul has eaten the fattest food? Can your soul be so satisfied with Jesus that there's nothing in this world that can satisfy it anymore? Can your soul be so satisfied that it's like after you have drunk Coke, someone should now give you walnuts and it tastes bitter in your mouth? That kind of satisfaction. He says, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. That joyful sanctification, not tedious sanctification, not angry sanctification, but joyful sanctification where you are living for God and it makes you happy. He says, when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, he says, for you have been my help and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. Ha! Where your Christianity is so sweet to you, the hymns of the goodness of God come to you spontaneously. Where you can sing of the goodness of God and the joy that God has brought into your life. Verse 8, look at it. It says, my soul clings to you and your right hand upholds me. He said, my soul clings, my soul clings to you. This thing, this thing, this thing is sure that if this thing happened, David but did not write this psalm when he was seen by Sheba. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? There's a satisfaction that comes. He had gotten to a place where he said his soul was thirsty for God. Where he said even his flesh is fainting. Like if God, give me God, I beg. He said my flesh is fainting. That description is, I'm too tired, I need Jesus. It's not, I'm too tired, I, I need a break. It's not, I'm too tired or... No, he said, my soul faints. My flesh faints for God. He says, God's love is better to him than anything in this life. He says, his soul is satisfied with God as if his soul has eaten fat food. He says, his soul clings to God. The key to a successful pulling down of idols is when God's love expels them. When you enjoy God more than you enjoy your sins. When you delight in God more than you delight in your sins. Brothers and sisters, I've seen, I've seen a couple of people come out of this pornography addiction. I know it's a big problem. I don't even need to use word of knowledge. I know it's a big problem for a lot of people. Do you know what has helped a lot of people? People have come out of it consistently. It's a place where you love God so much. Where you are satisfied so much with God. That you will see even the thought of that website. You'll be like, no. No. I will not do this. Not because the temptation is not there, but because your love for God and your satisfaction with what God has done for you is so much that you see it and you say no. No. I will not add one more click to this industry that is destroying lives. I will not add one more click and one more dollar or one more contribution because every time you go, you are sponsoring that demonic industry. I love my God so much to be a partaker of this evil. I love my God so much to partake in this nonsense. That you can say, Lord, my soul clings to you. I will not do this thing. Because in those moments of temptation, fear is not enough to stop you. In those moments of temptation, fear is not enough to stop you. It is only the love of God that can give you a consistent sanctification. That's why Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, verse 18, look at what he says. He said, let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on and on in details about visions, popped off without reason by his sensual mind. And many people can relate to it, you understand? Talking about angels, let's not go with that, let's go on. And not holding fast to the head from which the whole body nourished and knit together through his joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. 
If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of this world, why as if you were still alive in the world do you submit to regulation? Do not handle, do not taste, referring to things that can perish according to human precepts and teachings. These indeed have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the what? It's not by muzzle. It's not by asceticism. It's not by torturing yourself. It's not by doing what Origin did where he castrated himself. I respect the guy, right? And so, so church, church fathers, let's give them their place. Another. But you can't say, ah, yeah, I, ah, fornication, adoption. I'm not castrating myself. Mm. Those things have no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. What really has value is in the expulsive love of God. So, how do we get to the place where we can cling to God, like David said? Where you can love God and your soul is fainting for God. And because your soul is so attached to God, all those other enjoyments, they begin to lose their hold and their strength over you. How do we get and receive this um, expulsive love? We grow in love till it's expulsive. And our love grows by obedience and duty. There's this interesting line I learned from Tim Keller. It says, we grow from duty towards delight. We grow from duty to, I want you to write it down. Our love grows to become expulsive by obedience and duty. You grow from duty to delight. David explains it very well. Look at, what, look at the things that David said in Psalm 63. In one place, he says, I looked upon you in the sanctuary. I beheld your power and your glory. That's the reason why you don't... You, you... In obedience and in duty, that love that the Holy Spirit has shed upon your heart, it can grow to an expulsive love that will kick out all the idols of your heart. And how you get to that point is by constantly obeying God. By obeying God. When God says that you should, not be, you should not neglect the garden of the saints, you obey God. It is your duty to be in church. You cannot be the person stabbing church and be complaining that you are struggling with idols. Your idols will kill you. Your idols will kill you. C.S. Lewis has a brilliant, um, a brilliant analogy that happens from his own personal life about this matter of me meeting with other people. You can, there's a way you can never know God. You can never love God. You can never see the love of God in certain ways unless you see the love of God in certain dimensions in other people's lives. He talked about how he lost one of his friends and all of them were a group together and one of them died and they thought that the, the ones that were left that they, are, they will have more time with each other because the other person had died and everything that at least that's a silver lining that there are fewer of us who can have more time for each other but what they found out was that what he found out or what they found out in their group is that when that person died a part of that their friend the one that was left also died because that one when he was alive he's the one that had a way of pulling certain things out of that friend so when that one died the dimension of that person that they used to see in that person that died's presence they didn't see it again there are some things about God you will never see except you interact with other believers. Yes, Ben Imoso. There are some things about the beauty of God's holiness and power that is by looking in other people's lives and hearing from them that you can see what God does. That you can know the power of God. That's why David says, I look upon you in your sanctuary. I don't play with, God, with church. You must obey that. In our place, it says, I will bless you and give you glory. Thanksgiving and acknowledgement. Being aware of what God has done for us. And in our place, it says, I remember you and I meditate on you. I remember you and I meditate. I think about you in the night. Paul, Paul says this in another way. He says, put your eyes on things that are above and not on things below. Meditating on what God has done. That's why you notice something, especially those that are addicted to pornography and all that. You notice that that idol usually comes and stresses your life the most when you are stressed. When you don't have time. When you don't have time. When you are constantly at work and Lagos is bashing you and all that and all that. You notice that those idols, that's when they rear up their heads. Yeah, there's a reason why. Because there's a, there's a calmness and an awareness that comes upon you that allows God to feel your awareness when you can think about God. When you can meditate on what God has done. Look at, I, I shared this um, scripture some weeks ago, Psalm 39. 
Look at Psalm 39. Psalm 39. Look at verse 3. He says, My heart became hot within me. As I mused, the fire burned, and then I spoke with my tongue. There's a way that the love of God can burn in your heart. When you think, when you think and think, when you think, when you meditate, when you put your mind on things. A, a, an absent-minded Christianity is a Christianity that is going to be the prey of idols. An absent-minded Christianity that never meditates on God's word, never spends time thinking. Listen to me. That you don't have to read all the biggest theology books and obscure Latin books and all that. You can read some simple books. Read Desiring God. Read all those small books and think about your God. Think about your Jesus. Think about what he has done for you. Think about God. Think about God. This is what you can do. This is your duty. This is your obedience that God will use to flame your love till it becomes an explosive, fiery, powerful love in your heart that will kick out all your idols. Let's travel together. Stay away from sin. Flee every appearance of evil because you love God. Your love is growing and it will become expulsive. If you know that being alone is a problem for you, then don't stay alone. Go and stay with someone. Put yourself under accountability. Put yourself under accountability. Change your phone if you have to change your phone. If that person has been a constant source of temptation for you, break up with the person. So travel together. As you dutifully obey, obey God and stay away from in, your inordinate passions, and you create structures around yourself, you prevent your passions from being stirred up or to give you an opportunity to sacrifice to them. So travel together. And finally, let me say this. Always run back to God. Always run back to God. God knows that you are weak. God knows that he's the one that can help you. So there's your part. Behold God in the sanctuary, meditate on God's word, meditate on what God has done for you, be a grateful person, give thanks, give thanks, give glory to God, you know, obey God in putting structures about yourself, flee from every appearance of evil and all those things. But this is one thing that God will do for you because God knows that you are broken and there's a supernatural dimension to it where it is God that will cleanse your heart and heal you. Church, I hear what I'm saying to you. That's what the writer of Hebrews is talking about in Hebrews chapter 4. Let's just end there. Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 14 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. So the Bible acknowledges that we are weak. None of us are strong. None of us are strong. All our strength is in Jesus. We are not strong by ourselves. But one who in every aspect has been tempted as we are and yet without sin. He said, Let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. It's the same David that wrote Psalm 63 that got to a point that he messed up. Do you know what he did when they caught him? What did he do? He will fall flat. He will fall flat before God. If there's any enjoyment or anything in your life that has held you bound, that is holding you in a chokehold. If as you are working with God and all that, you are growing, you find yourself weak and you fall at any certain points. What you do is that you run to God and fall flat before God and say, Lord, help me. You admit what you have done. You say, Lord, I've done this thing wrong. I've messed up again. Forgive me and help me. Anybody that tells you that asking for forgiveness is not for Christians wants to kill you. They want to destroy your soul. Because it's when you fall before the throne of grace that you receive mercy and grace. If you mess up, if something happens, there was a low moment, there was pressure, you just found yourself doing that thing again. You will run to God and say, Lord, I am your child. You cuckoo died for me. You understand that? Uh You cuckoo died for me. Forgive me and help me. Give me grace. Ah, that thing works. It's a miracle the way God uses that thing for us. You will see supernatural grace. After some time, you will just look back and you'll be counseling someone and you'll be remembering when you used to have that problem and don't have it again. 
There is a grace of God to help us in times of need. Run to God. Run to God. Half of the problem with these idols is recognizing them. Half of their solution is recognizing them. The other half is running to God. When you can recognize them and you can know that this thing is a problem for me, this thing is destroying my life, run to God and receive grace. And this thing is not just obviously for this enjoyment, it's not just for the idols of enjoyment and hedonism. If you have all the other idols too of money and the idol of pride and ego, and you know it is worrying your life, run to God and receive grace. Say, Lord, help me. And keep praying that prayer. Don't pray those empty prayers where your mind is absent. When you are praying prayer of confession, you don't outsource it. You don't speak in tongues when you are confessing your sins. Did you hear what I said now? You don't confess your sins in tongues. You will open your mouth with your own mouth and say, God, this is what I did. I need help. Lord, this is what I did. I need help. This thing will destroy my life. Help me with these desires. Kill me. Supply grace. Help me. Oh Lord, help me. And because God is faithful, he will help you. Let's bow down our heads and let's pray. Because I know that we are weak and there's nobody here that is strong without God, I can guess well that everybody needs to pray this prayer. Pray and say, Lord, I need grace. Lord, I need your grace. Lord, help me. Our idols are deceitful. They are strong and we are weak. But God's grace can help us and give us strong strength. God's strength can be shown in our weakness. God's strength can be shown in our weakness. My brothers and sisters, let's ask for grace. The past few weeks we've, we've heard so much and we spent so much time thinking and as the world was going, we spent time thinking. We we're thinking and thinking, thinking and thinking to yourself. Let's pray that the Lord will grant us grace. Ask for grace. Oh Lord, grant me grace. Grant me grace, Lord, in my weakness. Lord, grant me grace in my weakness. Grant me grace in my weakness. Help me to turn away from my idols that are misusing me and torturing me, that have enslaved me, that are preventing me from enjoying a good life in you, that are preventing me from enjoying you and knowing the bliss that comes from knowing you and enjoying you. Father, Grant me grace to turn away from them. Lord, stir up my love. Stir up my love. Grant me grace to be a dutiful and obedient son. Stir up my love till it is an expulsive love. A love that expels Dagon. A love that expels all idols from your temple, which is my body. Lord, stir up my love. Stir up my love. Grant me grace to obey, to do the things that I ought to do. To do the things that I ought to do that I may enjoy your good in the land of the living, that I may serve you well, that I may fulfill your plan for my life, that on that day when you arrive in your beauty and your glory and your splendor, I would have no fear but love, that on that day when I see you, I would not be afraid like those who don't know you, but I'll be full of love, full of joy when I see your face, that day when you're gonna make everything all right, that day when you're going to make everything worth it, that day when you balance all the equations and make everything make sense, that day when you will come and everything will finally make sense, Lord, that day I don't want to disappoint you. I want to be full of joy and love that day. Help me, O oh Lord, and glorify yourself, you alone, and work all things together for my good. Thank you, Father in heaven. Thank you, Lord, our Father. Thank you, Sovereign Lord. In Jesus' name we have prayed. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. Amen. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. Amen. May he send you help from the sanctuary Amen. and give you support from Zion. Amen. May he remember all your offerings Amen. and regard with favor all your sacrifices. Amen. May he grant you your heart's desires Amen. and fulfill all your plans. Amen. May we shout for joy over your salvation. May, we live, may the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Some people may trust in chariots. Some people may trust in horses. Some people may trust in their money. Some may trust in their power and their influence. Some may trust in their gifts. We in this house will trust in the name of the Lord our God alone. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Hallelujah. God bless.